Everyone, do you have a cell phone, smartphone, something like that? Yeah? Okay. Um, I want you to use your phone for a moment to be a citizen journalist. And, or if you have a laptop or an iPad, uh, I want you to tweet. Um, so we have our, our hashtag, TEDx Monterey. If you want to reference me in the tweet, haha, -ha, it's <laughs> at MS Kiwis. Or update your Facebook status. Or even if you haven't done this yet, go find the TEDx Monterey page and like it. Okay? So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do that. And if, you're, if you don't know what to tweet, well, you can do this, all right? So go for it. <laughs> and I'll wait. And I've got my phone, so I'm going to take a picture of all of you out there. So that way I can also participate in this mass experiment. Let's see what it looks like. Da 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 da. Ooh, yeah, there you are. And later on, when you're not looking, I'll update it to find my Facebook status. So, congratulations. We just created a new institution. A, we are now a distributed core of journalists with more power over the future of TEDx Monterey than the local newspapers and broadcast media. Just like that, all of us participating contributed to the collective knowledge of what's going on in this room today. In Egypt, this kind of behavior combined with you know, the ease of use of Facebook in terms of commenting, posting, scheduling events, were key in helping to organize and mobilize activists behind the revolution. So, here's one of my big ideas for the day. We believe that the future of peace is not in the institutions that we're used to dealing with, which are formal governments, NGOs, bureaucratic organizations, but instead with flexible crowds assembled at need. And if you think about it, TEDx is a great example of that because it's a group of volunteers who've come together to put an event together without creating a 501c3 or a formal structure or anything like that. At the Stanford Peace Innovation Lab, we focus on how to understand and leverage these phenomena in order to create a dramatically more peaceful world. And there you go, there's your tweet. So today I'm gonna to talk, first of all, about behavior, okay? So many of our big global challenges are rooted in individual behavior. If we think about climate change, healthcare crisis, uh, you know, how we design our cities, all these things, if we look at um, the potential solutions and the, the sources of those problems, it's based on what we do. So the trends and events that we read about in the paper are all emergent phenomena, and you really have to un, uh, examine these things and the in individual acts that comprise them so that way we can begin to construct solutions for them. So the key thing is, this means you don't have to design society or policy or institutions. You only have to design behavior. And the good news is, is that positive behavior can be designed. So there you go, sign back. And you can tweet this as well, OK? So within the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, we use the uh, FOG behavior model framework. And so whenever we want to design an intervention or a behavior, we look at it very simply. So if Einstein said E equals MC squared, BJ Fogg says B equals MAT, where M is motivation, A is ability, and T is trigger. If you want someone to do something, if you want a dog to do something, you have to have all three of these in order for the behavior to occur. The motivations can be, um, I tend to think of them as right brain. Uh, they're social, they're emotional. Uh, acceptance, rejection, all those things come into play in terms of why you might be motivated to do something. Ability is a big deal. You know, can people do the thing that you're asking them to do, or is it too complicated? So as one of the, in the TED video, you know, this, is, this tension between complexity and complicated. So if, the, if you're asking someone to recycle, but you don't make it easy for them to do it, they're not going to do it, okay? So simplicity is very, very key. And the last thing you need is a trigger. There needs to be a call to action in order for people to do it when you want them to do it. Speaking of triggers, so if you want to tweet this, you can do that right now. In the lab, we talk about putting hot triggers in front of motivated people. So if people are primed to want to do something and you made it simple enough, then you need to have the little birdie on the screen to say like, oh, this is the time I should tweet, right? Once you do that, then you start um, conditioning people toward that behavior. Dogs are really good at this, you know. When it's time for them to go for a walk, they go and sit by the door. 
<laughs> and you go, oh, I need to take the dog for a walk. <laughs> so triggers can lead to a chain of behaviors. And so in the lab, we always look at starting with the smallest behavior possible. So one example that we use is, you know, if you need to floss your teeth, we say, well, the minimum viable action you should do is to just, to just floss one tooth. If you can't manage to do all of them at night, at least do one of them. In startups, the, the counterpart to that would be a minimum viable product. But the key thing is that everything big starts small, OK? So if we were to look at how to do this in a stepwise fashion, you know, you choose the behavior, the metric, you prototype an intervention, you measure the impact, and you iterate. And when we think about it, behavior design is inherently an agile process. Because there's this trial and error, and you're getting very, very specific about it, you can see whether or not it's effective, OK? Now, the FOG model teaches us how to get individuals to take a particular action, but it lacks a framework co for coordinating the action into broad emergent systems. So we need to look to models for mass behavior uh, design, or what we refer to in the lab as mass interpersonal persuasion. Lucky for us, we have Farmville. <laughs> so Farmville is fascinating, aside from the fact that 75 million people a day play Farmville. So it's a form of massively multiplayer online games. I'm going to say that slowly for the translators, which are a particular type of mass behavior design. So the interesting thing about game designers is that they're, by necessity, they're experts in shaping and conditioning people into particular be behaviors in the games. And they move people toward bigger and more complex challenges, both individually and collectively. Um, and you know, no TED talk would be complete without talking about games, so here we are. Designers know how to manipulate emotions in order to motivate you to play, and they also understand uh, people, you know, the types of players who come to their games. And what's really fascinating is that you can actually break players down into different types of archetypes, OK? And I love these archetypes. <laughs> You've got your killers. <laughs> killers are the people who not only want to win, they want everyone else to lose, OK? <laughs> so they're the ones who are really nasty on the games because they just want to crush you. Achievers are kind of like your, your top 10% students because they just want to play the game really, really well. They want to get you know, all the badges and all the scores. And they're the A students of, of the game playing world. You have explorers, they're kind of like the ADD kids, because they're just walk, you know, poking around in the game, finding all the little tricks of the game. And then you have socializers. Now, socializers are inter interesting, because they're people who are looking for opportunities to have non-confrontational interactions with other people. <laughs> all right. In other words, these people are highly motivated toward having peaceful outcomes. You know, so the game is just a convening uh, event, an excuse to chat and be with other people. So if you design any kind of behavior for mass, you know, um, change, you need to consider that people like to socialize, all right? And when we look at something like Farmville, probably 75, 80 percent of the people in that behavior profile are socializers, okay? So you better make it fun. <laughs> so here we go, the tweetable moment, the Bartle <laughs> game player archetypes, achievers, Expert, explorers, killers, and socializers, and keep in mind that most people are socializers. All right, we're just slackers, we just want to have a good time. <laughs> so, we also have to talk about gamification and dashboards. So, people are conditioned to progressively improve their score on whatever the game is based on these dashboards and these feedback mechanisms, right? So, if you think about it, you can design games for good that can train people to improve their skills in coordination, collaboration, and constructive problem solving to improve the world. And certainly Jane McGonigal at TED last year pointed this out. Okay? So this is another, uh, you know, another tool in the toolkit that we have here. So now I'm going to progress on to culture, and especially a particular type of culture, which is remix. So, hip hop, music, Creating a new song is pretty easy. You take an old song, change one thing, and now you have a new one. Hip-hop artists do this all the time, sampling and remixing old uh, music to create a new derivative work. In software, we do this as well. And in the open source community, it's referred to as forking. 
And so what you do in software is you start with a project, and then if you want to do a derivative work, it forks off into a new direction. Okay? And also, in, for relay people, you would be, this would be familiar as mashups. So you take a Google map, and you take data, and you put it together. So this idea of remixing stuff is, is a pretty strong one in the arts, entertainment, and in technology. Now, building on that, in the Bay Area, you know, we're pretty good at this because we're, not, we're known not only for technological innovation, but also social innovation. So, you know, we have deep roots with the free speech movement, uh, gay rights, the environmental movement, and so on. And what we've learned, what's, you know, in the water in our culture is that anyone can start a new movement. You know, it doesn't have to come from the top, it's individuals. And by articulating what makes it different and then spreading the word. So, what's possible now and what's different is that we have software that you, uh, that's designed for this emergent behavior that's combining with the culture. So, whenever you have technology that makes something easier to do, in the B equals MAT, we've added ability. So even though you were motivated to do something that was too hard to do, all of a sudden you have this new technology that's introduced, and all of a sudden it's easy to do, guess what? There's a whole lot of that new stuff happening. So there's this opportunity to create dynamically these, these dynamic new organizations, institutions, groups, and movements. And especially because they're bottom-up. So let me talk a little bit about bottom-up organizations. Okay, so we've got the behavior, the guy, we have the games, and we have this, this thing of remixing, right? Well, now let's throw up the bottom-up organizations, and probably the quintessential one online is Wikipedia. But, you know, Linux and Mozilla Foundation are also other examples of these peer-to-peer -peer network communities. And the way they, they're run is that the social norms and behaviors are determined by the members of the community themselves. So if you go to Wikimedia Foundation, they don't actually set the rules for how the community operates. The community does. It's all bottoms up. So the way these communities work is based on trust and reputation. How do you earn trust and reputation? What's well, based on what you do, your behavior. Okay. So in uh, the technology world, you can build your, tri um, your reputation by the things that you do. You can s and you always start small. You fix bugs you work on documentation, you help users, and a lot of these systems have, again, again, this game mechanics um, of showing you what you're, so this guy, Darren Dimitrov, he has 172,413 reputation points, you know, and if I was to show you the rest of the screen, they would break down where those reputation points were earned. So in technology companies like Google and Red Hat and others also participate in this way because they found that by operating in open source, they get a better product if, than if they try to do it themselves in a top-down manner. So, you know, you need to open it up, open it up to people. I'm not telling you anything new about this, but I just want to have it uh, top of mind for you. So the combination of this behavior design, peer-to-peer, -peer, bottoms-up communities, and this culture of remixing can result in accelerated, measurable collective action, especially when you throw the software in there, okay? So let's tie it all together. In 2009, we launched a project called PSTOT, and our flagship partner was Facebook. And when we were talking to Facebook, we said, you know, the things that you're doing on your platform are actually creating measurable ways of improving world peace. They said, really? We said, yes, really. And so what we did was, uh, you know, you have all this data of people friending, and you have all this profile information. Why don't we see how many people are friending each other across conflict boundaries, religious, geographic, political boundaries? Just for grins. Let's see what the data looks like. This is a snapshot from yesterday. Uh, yesterday, 18,222 Israeli Israelis and Palestinians friended each other on Facebook. Now, when you think about it, you go like, no, 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 these people aren't making friends at all. But we actually have data. So it's not about opinion or conjecture. We can measure this. And Facebook tracks this on a daily basis. And they look at Albania, Serbia, India, Pakistan, Greece, Turkey, the, the religious, you know, Christians and Muslims, and so on. And the political is actually between Re Republicans and Democrats. Um, <laughs> Speaking of conflict boundaries. But the key thing is that once you can measure, you have a baseline. 
And once you have a baseline, you can design new uh, experiments, software-mediated experiments, to see if you can start tunneling behavior so that you can increase the number of friendships. Or we might look at a particular date and say, why, did those, why was the rate of friendship low that day? Was there some incident that occurred on that day? So we begin to look at those factors. Uh, last year, we got very involved in uh, the Haitian earthquake and observing that in terms of new emergent behavior. So what was fascinating about Haiti was that in contrast to Katrina, which, as, we would, as my mother would say, was a desmadre by any, any person's standards, <laughs> Uh, you know, the government wasn't able to respond, uh, NGOs, everyone was just caught flat-footed. But Facebook was confined to college students and Twitter didn't exist. So the social media impact on a disaster could be measured with Katrina, and we saw all these people suffer. In Haiti, in contrast, what was fascinating to see was that, as usual, um, governments and NGOs were getting into a pissing match over who could land in the airport. <laughs> Meanwhile, Volunteers were driving through from the Dominican Republic, bringing supplies in on the ground using Twitter, Facebook, Google Groups, and YouTube to provide data and witness of what people actually needed. And we actually we got caught up in that and worked on a project to adapt an iPhone application for use in field hospitals, and we got it done in nine days. And this was done by a group of committed individuals. So we didn't do any fundraising, we didn't start a 501c3, we didn't do any of that. A friend of mine put the call out saying, we need to put this together, how can we do it? And we ha I still have the screenshots of all the Facebook wall comments as we're brainstorming how to get this done. And we did it. The Arab Spring, I think, has absolutely riveted everyone. And it bears special mention. You know, when we look at it, I love this, I love this image because it's Facebook January 25, hashtag January 25, so it's a mashup of Facebook and Twitter, and they're saying it's the Egyptian social network. I think if I was Facebook, I couldn't buy that kind of brand loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> and this other photo that I love at the bottom that you can't see very well is that, um, parenthetically, if you're going to start a revolution, someone better bring a lot of extension cords and power strips. <laughs> So the key thing is that these activists in Tunisia and in Egypt organized in this loose, ad hoc, peer-to-peer -peer way. Again, they didn't start, you know, an organization and da-da-da-da-da. Instead, they, they put the call out. They used, you know, their phones, text messages, Facebook pages, um, Facebook events um, to rally and change public sentiment around these issues. And they used this iterative process. So, you know, for some, they would schedule multiple protest events on Facebook. I'm sure you all get event invites on Facebook. And they would put it up, and then they would see how many people would RSVP. And they would have this minimum level and said, well, you know, if we don't get more than 2,000 people RSVPing, we're not going to do the protest. And so they tested it. And they also set up polls on their pages to determine what, you know, people's opinions were like. And so in essence, what they did was they applied this agile, metric-driven strategy to determine how to recruit, rally, and organize activists. You know, they're using the, the behavior um, triggers within Facebook because people are conditioned to comment and to, to like and so on, and they used all that to give them data to inform them on how to plan. Now, this is all great, you know, to start a revolution, but what happens after the revolution? So the challenge shifts from organizing protests to collaboratively governing. And this is where, you know, that open source kind of mentality really plays in. And uh, we met with the State Department the other day, and they said, so what are you, you know, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And I go, have you seen the pirate pad version of the Tunisian constitution? And this is a screenshot. And basically, there are two uh, crowdsourced efforts that are going on in Tunisia. And this one, you could see the authors are all down here, Khaled, Karkana, Aziz, Etham. And so they have a different color code, and they're all editing the Tunisian constitution. There's a separate effort that they're doing it on a wiki. They're like, hmm, very interesting. A little bit of remix going on. Um, and to me, what this does is it marks an important trend, because we're seeing this crossover, just as uh, cell phones provided 
an opportunity for the developing world to leapfrog in terms of telecommunications, I think these social and mobile technologies are allowing the Arab world to leapfrog as well. And I think it's going to be a really exciting incubator for political innovation because they're not bogged down in legacy. They get to do new things, and I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out. Even if they fail, it's going to be agile. Um, the mindset of the people in, in Tunisia and Egypt has been transformed because now they say, we're willing to try something new, and we're going to learn, and we're going to iterate and move forward. So I'm almost done. <laughs> the key thing here is that old institutions have a difficult time responding to change. And if we want to design new ways of peace, we can't rely on those old institu institutions. Instead of focusing our efforts on fixing or changing them, let's take advantage of the ease of putting together flexible crowds that are assembled at need to solve specific problems. And this doesn't require this top-down global design. Because you know what? The new global is local open source, OK? So what you want to do is develop new measurable behavior-driven uh, interventions for peace that work for you for your local problems, where you are, and then you share those solutions with everyone else. So that way they can take that idea and remix it. Okay? By creating these replicatable local solutions, I think we'll be able to create these agile global solutions that will result in measurable improvement in the world. And with that, I am done. Thank you. Thank you.